Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the second lecture on uh, phonetics and phonology uh, broad overview uh, NPTEL MOOCs course. In the previous lecture, we went through the basics of sound and sound representation in linguistics. So, we looked at the problems of sound versus spelling. So, how writing systems represent them the sounds that is and how actually we produce them and very often there may be irregularities in that representation. And we showed for instance how the English system, the writing system can be very irregular and very often it shows that the alphabets actually do not represent the sounds systematically across the writing system. So, uh, you would see in the previous lecture that whenever there is a G H sound, it can be sometimes pronounced as F, sometimes it is silent and there is always that inconsistency and that is not just with regard to one sound, it is across the writing system of English. Now, because of that, there are various degrees of these irregularities across writing systems. Some systems are more inconsistent, some systems are more consistent. However, linguists need a system to represent the sounds of the languages of the world and that is called the International Phonetic Alphabet. And we showed a bit of transcription as to how the sounds are represented. We showed with the example from English consonants, what are the symbols that are used for a, a few English consonants which are not there in the writing system of English. And again we talked a bit about phonetics and phonology and what are these two branches within linguistics, how we understand phonology vis-a-vis -vis phonetics and what are the domains that come under these two branches. And finally, we studied a bit about consonants, consonant production. Now, in the second lecture, we will talk more about production of consonants. We will see how place of articulation, manner of articulation, state of the larynx and a bit about vowels if there is time. So, we are now looking at the International Phonetic Alphabet and we already discussed this in the previous class that all these uh, sounds are represented in letters similar to English in a few instances. However, in other instances like th, th or uh, in the representation of ng or ng or other sounds uh, like sh, j, these are not what we see in English. Now, coming back to speech production, to produce speech, as we have already discussed, air must flow out from the lungs through the vocal tract and the vocal folds. It could also come out through the nasal cavity, the mouth or the oral cavity. And then the vocal folds will vibrate for the production of some voice sounds. And also air releases through the nose for certain sounds which are nasal or nasalized. Okay. Now, what are the important uh, parts of that articulation. So, the three important things which we already mentioned the other day, place of articulation, manner of articulation and vocal fold voicing. There may be others which characterize the sounds that we produce like air flow through nasal cavity or lip rounding. So, remember that these are important things in articulation. In place of articulation, what are the 
places which play a role in the production of sounds. So, these are the lips, the tongue tip, the tongue body and the tongue has various parts within it. So, the tongue is the tongue tip, the tongue blade, the tongue body, all these parts of the tongue play different roles while producing speech. And the larynx is another um, articulator which plays a very important role and which obstruct the air flowing out of the lungs. Whereas vowels are different because they are always relatively open, we can describe types of consonants in terms of how much obstruction is involved. Uh, nearly all sounds of the languages of the world are produced through the pulmonic air stream which means the air is pushed out of the lungs. Okay. This is the pulmonic air stream where the air is pushed out of the lungs. Sometimes we may have glottalic air stream, air is pushed out of the glottis and then sometimes we might have the veloric air stream where from the velic region and these are where clicks are produced. The veloric air stream, the air trapped within and the articulators there and released that produce the sound called clicks. So, we have uh, already uh, discussed these things pulmonic can produce implosives, ejectives and the velaric airstream can produce clicks etcetera. So, this is the uh, vocal tract and we can see that there is a passage through which air will pass out from the lungs for the production of specifically speech sounds. And this air is then modified by the vocal tract. So, various places within this vocal tract will modulate the sound. So, the air which goes through the vocal tract may be modified at the teeth region it may be modified here the dent these are called dental sounds upper teeth lower teeth and then this gum the area behind the upper teeth which is in the shape of a ridge is which plays a very important role in the production of of very many sounds is called the alveolar ridge and then we have the hard palate which you will feel with your tongue if you take it backwards you'll feel the hard palate of course, the nasal cavity is, is not a part of this oral tract, it is a nasal cavity which is accessed for the production of sounds when the velum, this velum part is lowered then air can move out through the nasal cavity producing nasalized nasal sounds. And then we have the pharyngeal region, the epiglottis which actually shuts off the passage through which our food passes and then we have the esophagus and we also have the trachea. So, uh, it is important to remember that some of these articulators can move and these are the lips which also produces very specific sounds, the tongue can move and can produce specific sounds which are uh, the result of the obstruction that the tongue creates inside the vocal cavity and then the glottis and the uvula. So, the glottis consists of the vocal folds which can vibrate and give very distinct quality to sounds or can produce sounds in the glottal because of the glottalic air stream. And then there are uvular sounds which are produced. The uvula is the is the fleshy part towards the end where the the palate ends. The fleshy hanging part is called the uvula. So uh, these are your descriptions of the various parts of the vocal tract that we discussed so far. And um, important things to remember here is that the alveolar ridge is plays a very crucial role in the production of sounds. The palate is important, the soft palate of the velum which ends in the uvula. And if the velum is raised, 
This closes the velopharyngeal port preventing the passage of air from the oral to the nasal cavity. However, if it is lowered, so a lot depends on the lowering or the raising of the velum. Again, these are the parts that we just discussed. The tongue is sort of muscular body which we can divide into the tip, the body, root and the epiglottis, the role of the epiglottis is to cover the trachea allowing the food through the esophagus. This is another view, this is an x-ray which shows the cavities of the, the oral cavity and the nasal cavity. So, these are the two cavities which are used for the production of sounds. So, the larynx is extremely important for humans in the production of speech sounds. It is a sort of a valve, it is encased in cartilage and then it opens wide during breathing and closes when you swallow. So, coming to now manner of articulation, stops involve complete obstruction and sudden release of the air. Those are the two important parts of the production of stop sounds. So, there should be full closure for the production of stop sounds. Nasals also involve complete closure in the oral cavity, but the air release is through the nasal cavity. Fricatives have partial construction and slow release and it is the air is pushed out through a narrow passage slowly unlike that of stops. So, very often because of narrow passage we have a hissing sound when we have fricatives. And an affricate is a term used for sequences made with the same articulator. So, and then approximants of the least obstruction lesser than fricatives, but more than vowels. So, uh, then we have these, these are approximants in English for instance, lur, uh, wa. In lur, the tip of the tongue makes full contact with the alveolar ridge, but the air is released on both sides of the tongue. So, let us now have a look at the manner of articulation. Here, what you can visualize is the production of for instance, t and the for instance. So, as t and the are being produced, there is complete obstruction and then the air is released. And then, unlike the oral stop for the production of nasals now, what you can see importantly is the lowering of the velum. The velum is lowered and hence the air can be once the velum is lowered, the air can pass through the nasal cavity. For the production of trill like sounds, so there you can see that you have very short periods of obstructions for the production of trills like tr. So, with slower uh, beating we have tap or flap, we will discuss these differences between trills taps and flaps when you are discussing sounds of the world's languages in greater detail. So, unlike the stop before, so the production of which we had to make a complete obstruction. For the production of fricative for instance, you can see that it is partial, there is partial obstruction here. Uh, when you are producing suppose a fricative sound like z or s, you can see that the obstruction is partial. We will discuss lateral fricatives later when we discuss sounds of the world's languages. Now, uh, the least obstruction as we said is when we have approximants. So, here we have r, y, w and then we have l. So, uh, that was on, uh, to show you through video descriptions as to how these sounds are produced. And we are going to discuss more of these sounds when we discuss the sounds of the world's languages. Coming now to the place of articulation then, 
So, when, when the lips are involved, then we have bilabials. When both the teeth and the lower lip are involved in the production of the consonants, so where you have a constriction of the upper teeth with the lower lip, then we have labiodentals. And dentals obviously involves the constriction of, of the tongue tip and the upper teeth. So, and then there are the other types called post alveolars like sh -z in English, which involve constriction of tongue tip and palate and the just behind the alveolar ridge. So, palatals involve constriction of the tongue body and the palate. Then we have the velars, where the tongue body make a constriction in the velic region. And then we have glottals, which involve constriction of the vocal folds. So, let us look at place of articulation. So, this is bilabial, this involves the construction happening there at the lip region. Okay. Now, whereas this involves the lower lip and the upper teeth, the lower lip and the upper teeth labiodental. Then we have the tip of the tongue making a constriction there at the upper teeth to produce a dental sound th and z. There are other places of articulation like alveolar as we discussed. Here you can see the tip of the tongue makes a constriction at the gum area of the behind the upper teeth. Then we have a post alveolar consonants like sh, z. You can see that it is moving, the tongue is moving towards the, the palatal region, the post, post alveolar region of the palate. And then we have retroflex consonants. Uh, we will discuss these later on and we will move on to discuss palatal sounds and where you can see the tongue body moves towards the upper palate. The velar region where the tongue body moves towards the velar region and then the uvular you can see that the back of the tongue makes a constriction at the uvular part, uvular velar palatal. And then there are uh, languages of the world which produces pharyngeal sounds. And this is what would happen in a pharyngeal sound that the back of the tongue would make a constriction the pharynx region. And whereas for glottal sound which is making a constriction. So, uh, talking about the glottis, this is the larynx which we already saw the other day. So, it is encased in all these cartilages. Okay. So, you have the you have these the cricoid cartilage, the thyroid cartilage, the arytenoid and the other parts. What is important here are these two flaps which vibrate to produce most of the voice sounds that we can hear. So, this is what happens in the production of voice sounds. This is called the state of the larynx. Is it voicing or not? As you can see in the diagram that we have a voicing sound here. We can classify consonants in terms of state of larynx during the, their production, that is whether there is voicing or whether it is the state of the larynx is voiceless. Now, uh, we have understood so far what is manner of articulation, it would be stop, fricative, approximate, you have complete closure or partial as you saw. And then we have place of articulation, the place inside the vocal tract where some obstruction is made to produce a sound and that is your place of articulation. The third important characteristic of sounds is called voicing. Now, how do you understand voicing? We often ask our students to do a test in the class. The test is to produce two sounds, a voice sound and a voiceless sounds together. So, you can try this for yourself 
you can try producing a v sound and a s and a f sound or a z sound and a s sound make it longer and put your hands right here where you can hear a a, a. so for boys it's easier for men it's easier you can put it above the adam's apple and for women also you can feel the vibration there at that position of your throat and whenever you are producing the voice sound like v or or z you can you can feel the vibration or unlike when you are producing the voiceless sound like s or f you can cannot hear the voicing. So, that is a test we ask our students to do in class so that they can feel the voicing for themselves. This is important because very often beginners in phonetics and phonology find difficult to make a distinction between voice and voiceless. This is um, very common among uh, the students that I have taught over the years because every sound is produced as a syllable. So, by the time you finish the voiceless part, the voice part of the vowel already starts and that is why it is difficult if you are a beginner to distinguish between voiced and voiceless sound. This the experiment that we just did helps you to see for yourself where there is vibration of the vocal folds and where you do not have the vibration. So, sounds produced with the vibrating vocal cords are said to be voiced and those produced without vocal cord vibration are voiceless. So, in English for instance all these consonants are voiced all these consonants are voiced and we have a fewer voiceless consonants but and sh and h. During the production of these voiceless consonants the glottis is open spread and air passes through the glottis without any vibration. There are various languages in the world which have different voicing, have different manner of articulation and for instance I would like to draw your attention to Hindi stop consonants. Now let us look at these Hindi stop consonants. So, unlike what we saw in English where we have the dental fricatives okay, and we did not have any dental stops. Now, in um, language like Hindi for instance, we would find dental stops, we would find post alveolar stops, we would find palato alveolar stops, we would find velar stops. So, after bilabial in English for instance, the dental part is not there. Now, apart from having all these places of articulation, another important uh, characteristic of sounds in a language like Hindi would be that the two important things to, to see here. One is that Hindi has a type of consonant called retroflex consonant. The other important thing is to look at this contrast. So, in Hindi now, so look at the bilabial or dental sounds, you have contrast across all these positions. So, we have not just a voiced and voiceless aspirated, we have the voiceless unaspirated, the voiceless aspirated as well as voiced aspirate. So, we have uh, like bal, pal, pal, pal. So, we know from our previous class that aspiration is the production of extra release, extra air in the release of a sound or sometimes also at the um, closure. So, those are different, but these are produced at the time of the release of the consonant of a voiceless aspirated sound. Now, Hindi and many Indian languages are unique for production of voiced aspirates. So, this is produced, this is this. So, in the production of which the vocal folds are vibrating, not just the vocal folds are vibrating, there is a breathiness in the 
phonation in the state of the larynx. So, we have voiced aspirate, voiceless aspirated, voiceless unaspirated and voiced. And this also is seen now in dental uh, place of articulation. You have the voiced, voiceless, you have the voiceless aspirated and you have the voiced aspirate. Again in the post alveolar uh, part you have dal, dal, dal and dal. Now this is where it becomes interesting because these sounds are produced by what is called the retroflexion. Now what is retroflexion? Let us go back to one of the previous slides. So this is a retroflex. What is unique about this movement is that we can see that the tongue curls. Okay? So the tip of the tongue tip of the tongue curls or becomes concave to produce an articulation like that of retroflex. So now uh, let us look at the English consonant chart and we will see that in English we have bilabial, we have labiodental, but we have stops only which are bilabial, alveolar and velar. But in, in, in a language like Hindi we saw that we can have bilabial, dental, post alveolar and velar as well. So uh, across all these places of articulation we can have um, stops. So not just a voiceless and voice counterparts, the aspirated and unaspirated counterparts as well as the voiced aspirated counterparts. So this is how languages can differ in the production of sounds, in the manner of articulation of sounds and if you look at the English consonant inventory then we see that many of these places are so, there will be languages which will have for instance dental stops, post alveolar stops, we will have glottal stops and we will have bilabial fricatives or uh, lateral fricatives. So, there are to a certain extent possible languages employ the possibilities provided by our vocal tract to produce distinctive sounds. However, some are impossible to produce and so we talked about this in the beginning of the course, articulatory ease is important, but to maintain distinctions languages will have a inventory of consonants which will help them to have a maximum number of contrasts in the production of in, in maintaining a lexicon which is mostly contrastive and can have meaning differences between the words so that if two words are uh, similar in the production then uh, there are very many uh, homophones in languages but the, the number cannot be extremely large then that will be a difficulty in maintaining the contrast. So uh, continuing our discussion on consonants and how we can see that different languages will make use of different places of articulation. So we, we just now saw uh, some Hindi examples where we saw that Hindi has a dental stops and Hindi has uh, alveolar, post alveolar retroflex stops, has palato alveolar uh, affricate. So basically all these five places of articulation are possible along with another complication that of retroflex in the uh, inventory of consonants. So Hindi is well known for these distinctions, four way distinction along uh, the line of uh, dental and post alveolar and uh, palatal alveolar and where all these uh, sounds can be retroflex. So where the post alveolar series are all uh, retroflex here and then we have this dental series 
and where the voice dental stop, then there is a voiceless dental stop, there is a voiceless aspirated dental stop and then there is a voiced aspirate or breathy uh, stop and uh, which are all dental. Similarly, you in the post alveolar series also you will find that we have the voiced, voiceless corresponding voiceless aspirate and the voiced aspirate or breathy and the distinction is not just with regard to post alveolar, they are also retroflex. And then whereas these are dental, these are post alveolar as well as retroflex and then it is also possible in Hindi to have these affricates. Okay? So, as we know affricates are a sort of combination of two types of two manner of articulation. So, it would here you would have a stop and a fricative. So, and note that along with uh, being palatoalveolar in Hindi they can also be uh, retroflex. So, we have voice, voiceless unaspirated, voiceless aspirated and voiced aspirated. And then finally, the villa where you have this, the commonly seen voiced villa stop, the voiceless villa stop, the voiceless aspirated villa stop and then the voiced aspirated breathy villa stop. So, you have and of course, the what we see in in English, the voiced versus voiceless, unaspirated, voiceless, aspirated, voiced, aspirated, all the four possibilities are present in Hindi. So, you can see the four way contrast here along the line of voice, voiceless, unaspirated, voiceless, aspirated and voiced, aspirated. So, along this line, these four contrasts are made and then along the line of place of articulation. So, we have bilabial to dental to post alveolar palatoalveolar velar. So, and then here we have these affricates okay. and also along with this being dental these are retroflex. Later when we will study the sounds of the world's languages diversity in the world's languages we will see how Hindi retroflex could be more apical rather than subapical. So, we will learn about those distinctions later. So, at the moment it is important to see that in the uh, stop inventory of Hindi uh, more distinctions are used because of the possibility of having dental sounds and having stop sounds at all these possible uh, levels of contrast. So, of course, there are much more complications that can be seen in languages of the world. This inventory is uh, different from English because primarily because Hindi has a contrast between voiceless unaspirated and voiceless aspirated whereas in English this is allophonic there is no contrast between the voiceless unaspirated and the voiceless aspirated. So, that is a contrast which is there in Hindi which is absent in English. The other contrasts which are absent in English are the uh, dental sounds instead in English we have alveolar in English and in English again we the, the retroflex uh, sounds are not there. So, and in Hindi the there is a uh, contrast available between voiced voiceless unaspirated, voiceless aspirated and voiced aspirated for the retroflex stops. So, this series is pretty unique to South Asian languages and also seen in Hindi, also seen in other languages like Sindhi etc. So, retroflexion and um, voiced aspirates which are again characteristics of South Asian uh, languages. So, one group of South Asian languages, the Indo Aryan group of language. So, you would uh, the voice aspirates are common. So, these are features of 
some groups of languages and not other groups of language and that is why we do not see that in Hindi, in English. And also another common contrast that we saw here is the velar one which is also in English has the velar stop, the voice velar stop and the voiceless velar stop. So, this contrast is available in English. However, the contrast which is not available in English is, is this one that we see here kal versus kal, so which is contrastive and mean two different words in this language. Finally, we also have the voiced aspirate here, so which I again mentioned just now, I mentioned just now and I would again like to emphasize these voiced aspirates are commonly seen in South Asian languages and therefore, this is not there in English. So, um, this was a small comparison of the differences which may be there in languages. We saw that some contrasts which are not there in English may be there as a contrastive in another language. So, we saw an Assamese example a while ago and now we see these Hindi examples where we see the contrast between the voiceless unaspirated and voiceless aspirate. And this is seen throughout the inventory at all places of articulation. And um, the other thing that we saw here is that um, languages may have, so whereas English may have alveolar and Hindi has dental um, and these two are commonly seen in the languages of the world, both the alveolar place of articulation, dental place of articulation. In our later sections, we will see how um, dental and alveolar gestures uh, could be different. So, they both could exploit different places of the tongue while making the articulation. So, while one can be laminal, the other can be apical and we will look at those differences as we go along in this course. So, uh, we come to the end of this uh, lecture on consonants and giving you a broad overview of consonants, place of articulation, manner of articulation and voicing the three most important characteristics. And um, in the next uh, section after we study acoustic phonetics, we will also study how there can be many more differences in the languages of the world and uh, many more different uh, quite a few other places of articulation and airstream mechanisms which can be uh, possible. Uh, to be used in the language of the world. And uh, coming now to the conclusion, um, consonants are movements at the beginning or end of a vowel because consonants by themselves do not occur, uh, there has to be a vowel. So, the vowels are sort of the main uh, parts of a word and then the consonants are uh, can be sort of gestures which move um, from a neutral state to another position. So, that is one way of looking at consonants. Of course, we have to remember all the other stages are there in the production of consonants that you have obstruction, that you have a release stage etcetera. But if you think about the obstruction and the release, so it you can see that it, it happens as certain gestures moving from a neutral state to another state uh, because there is always a vowel which has to be uh, articulated as well along with the consonant. So, um, the targets of these gestures um, give us the realization of consonants. So, we will talk more about gestures, about um, targets and gestures in the section where we are going to talk about diversity in the languages of the world. So, these three questions, uh, the answer to these three questions give you description of consonants. So, uh, what were the vocal folds um, doing during the production of the consonant? So, which means what is the uh, state of the glottis? So, essentially this will tell you whether the consonant was voiced or voiceless. Secondly, the answer, the question is where in the mouth is the sound made? This is a place of articulation. So, where was the obstruction and the place where the target, you know, 
and uh, gestures, what was the target of the gesture. So, you could also think about that in terms of uh, gesture of phonology and then also what happens to the stream of air from the lungs which means the um, manner of articulation. So, uh, was it uh, released like as in, a, as in a stop or in a fricative or affricate or uh, nasal or um, approximant etc. So, how was the stream of air released? So, where was the obstruction, how was it released and what is the state of the glottis? So, these three things are sort of very preliminary, um, give you a preliminary idea about what uh, consonants, how you would understand uh, the articulation of consonants. So, okay, so what were the vocal folds doing? They must be vibrating like this, then you would have a voice sound or if they were neutral like this, then you would have a voiceless sound and an plosive sound. So, manner of articulation, so you, you have a plosive, you have a nasal where the air is moving out of the nasal cavity also while making a uh, obstruction there inside the vocal ca cavity and then you can also have a trill as in the one here. So, you can see the rapid tapping of the uh, of the tapping or flapping of the tongue blade and there. Where in the mouth uh, the sound is made which is the place of articulation where do you have the constriction in bilabial, it is the lips, in labiodental it is the lower lip and upper teeth and in dental you have the, uh, the tongue making an obstruction with the uh, back of the upper teeth. So, here you would have consonants like fervor, here fervor and here uh, the dental fricatives s, z. More things that we would need to um, cover in the conclusion is that often what we need to remember is that there are plenty of dialectal differences when we talk about consonants. Um, just now we showed these two uh, dental fricatives s and z. So, now one dialectal difference there is the difference between interdental and dental. So, interdental is when you the tongue is placed between the two um, between the upper teeth and the lower teeth and then the release happens there. Unlike interdental, the dental is when the uh, tip of the tongue makes an obstruction on the uh, side of the back of the upper teeth. So, there is an obstruction there and which should account for the differences between interdental and, and dental. It is known that British English speakers and American English speakers, some uh, dialects of American English differ as to whether the sound produces uh, would be interdental or dental. It is known that uh, in, in American English you would find more interdental productions than in British English which would uh, normally be dental. So, uh, that was with regard to the two um, fricatives, dental fricatives in English. So, you have dialectal differences and that is not the only difference that you would find in terms of dialectal differences. There are many others as well. So, but um, that is one uh, thing that you can keep in mind and try to uh, hear the difference if you get an opportunity. Another thing to keep in mind is that it is not easy to feel what the tongue and lips are doing while producing a consonant. So, uh, the movements are pretty uh, fast to for us to notice what we have what we did with the tongue and lips when, when we said something and then uh, as a result. So, when we, s when we pronounce these um, approximants for instance, ya and wa. Um, we can feel here that the tongue goes towards the palatal region and for wa uh, actually there are two types of movements. So, we can feel the lip rounding and but also the, the back of the tongue goes up. So, 
uh, these are things that um, we might notice while we are producing consonants. To remember that there are dialectal differences that we are always not conscious that we cannot consciously uh, feel the differences while we are producing sounds. So, it may not be easy to keep a tab on the productions of our, uh, of our even if we are consciously trying. And finally, to sum up these are the consonants of English and we have already seen them the bilabial stops and these labiodental dental stops as we already know we saw that this is this place is occupied in Hindi not occupied in English the dental stop place labiodental stops not there and then we have alveolar stops post alveolar not there palatal not there and velar and these three are actually most commonly seen in the languages of the world that bilabial stops alveolar stops and velar stops we have more fricatives in english than we have stops so we have the we do not have bilabial um, we do not have bilabial stops we have labiodental fricatives we have dental fricatives you have alveolar we have post alveolar palatal not there velar not there and this is called the glottal fricative in English. So, it is called glottal fricative, it is there pushed out from the glottal region, but it is important to note that um, in the production of this voiceless uh, sound in English, it very often takes the, if we look at the spectrograms, if we look at the acoustics of how we will very often see that it takes the shape or formance of the surrounding vowels. Then coming to affricates, we have far fewer affricates. Uh, and this is true for almost all languages of the world. There are only two post alveolar affricates in English, ch and j, and all the other places are not occupied. We have uh, the nasal stops, we have the bilabial nasal, the labiodental nasal, and velar stops, and these stops, uh, and, and we have the approximants were uh, la, uh, and y, and um, also. Um, we do not have lateral approximant uh, and okay. The reason that I am crossing these places is to show that only a few of the places which are possible are occupied in uh, English. Now, when we study diversity in the world's language, we will see how many others are possible in the language of the world, how common they are. and uh, what is absolutely not possible in the languages of the world. So, for the time being we see that English has uh, uses almost most of the places of articulation and depending on uh, the manner of articulation of course and English has almost all the manner of articulation as well, but again does not have uh, each and every uh, manner of articulation for each and every place and similarly each and every uh, place is not occupied by, uh, is not exploited by each and every manner of articulation. So, uh, these are the consonants in English and um, that brings us to um, closer to uh, wrapping up this part of the uh, lecture on consonants. And very important things to remember again is that consonants in the word overlap. So, um, and also consonants in a word are influenced by the surrounding uh, vowels. So, hence uh, rip and rap will have slight differences because the following vowels are different even though they are pretty close as words. Similarly, um, very similar words like cart, crate and cat, the acoustics of these sounds uh, would be different because of the environment um, and uh, because of the different vowels, the consonants, uh, etc., which will influence the consonant. And we have to remember that um, these are differences that are uh, environmentally affected, that is the, the surrounding sounds, and there will be subtle differences always in the acoustics of uh, sounds uh, no matter what sound it is. So, in the next uh, class we will uh, talk about vowels and the cardinal vowel system etcetera. 
uh, for the time being for now it is um, important to remember that consonants um, involve obstruction, consonants involve modification of the air pushed out with lungs that is in the, the release is um, important. The state of the glottis is important whether the glottis was uh, whether it was vibrating or it was in a neutral state it is important and the glottis plays far more um, different roles also as we will see later on what is called phonation there again um, the glottis plays an independent role and gives uh, its own color to different vowels and consonants. So, the breathiness or the creakiness etc can be uh, effects can be the colors given by the glottis to different sounds. So, uh, apart from voicing the glottis plays other roles as well in the articulation of uh, various sounds. So, the glottis is, is very important. It gives the spectral shape and then it gives a spectral shape and then it is filtered in the rest of the vocal tract whatever is pushed out of the glottis. So, the state of the glottis tells you about voicing this is a basic thing one. Secondly, it is where you have the obstruction inside the vocal tract and then place of articulation and finally manner of articulation. We are not saying that these three alone uh, defines uh, everything that we need to know about consonants, but these are the main the preliminary things that we need to know about consonants. Apart from that um, there are other things other there is nasalization, there is lip rounding as we said there is uh, the other uh, influences uh, the other things done by the glottis like phonation etc which we are not studying now. So, these are the preliminary things that we need to remember about consonants. Thank you very much for uh, watching uh, stay tuned for the next lecture which is on vowels. Thank you.